Well, good afternoon, everyone. And like Philip said, uh, my name is Siobhan Harity. I'm curator of collections uh, here at the Displains History Center. And I will be talking with you guys this afternoon about uh, the Displains Park District. Because this year, 2019, is the centennial year of the Park District, and we are marking that event with our exhibit here that explores those first 100 years of the Park District. And the Displains Park District was founded on February 17, 1919. It's one of the oldest park districts in the state of Illinois. And over the course of its first century, um, as we'll see today, uh, the Park District really has grown with the Des Plaines community um, and has also responded to the changing needs of the community in that first century as well. Um, but before we talk about how the Park District was founded here in Des Plaines, um, we first need to take a step back, take a wider view at what was going on in the United States in 1919, the year the Park District was founded. And so 1919 uh, was the very end of a time in American history known as the Progressive Era. And this was a time uh, where there were a lot of social reform movements um, that influenced the formation of park districts like ours here in Des Plaines. Uh, the Progressive Era spanned roughly from about 1900 to 1920. And uh, there were a lot of political and social reforms uh, that were passed by Congress at that time. And among some of those laws um, were those that prohibited child labor, that broke up corporate monopolies, conserved natural areas as national parks, and that placed a legal limit on the length of a work week. Um, and some of the leaders of the progressive era uh, were some of the individuals we have here on the screen, Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson in Washington. Um, and then here in the Chicago area, one of the local progressive era reform leaders was Jane Addams of Hull House. And we'll talk a little bit more about Jane Addams uh, in just a moment. But outside of government in Washington, there were really two, uh, two progressive era reform movements that most influenced the formation of park districts. And those were the playground movements and the recreation movements. <coughs> Yeah, now the recreation movements, um, they grew concerns in response uh, to the new legal limits that were placed on work week lengths during the progressive era. Because as a result of these work week limits, more Americans had more free time than ever before and the leaders of the recreation movements uh, were afraid that too many people would choose to spend this newfound free time they had in places like saloons, pool halls, dance halls, taking in vaudeville shows. And the recreation movements, they believed that these types of places posed a threat to public safety and public morality. And so to combat those threats, um, they called for communities to establish public programs and public recreation facilities for things like concerts, musicals, festivals that would provide safer and more wholesome entertainment options um, for their members of the community. But the Playground movements uh, was another movement of the day that acted kind of in parallel uh, to the recreation movements. And the playground movement believed that kids also stood to benefit from the public recreation facilities and programs that the recreation movement was calling for. Providing kids uh, with public recreation space, they thought, would give kids a safe place to play. It would keep them out of the street, out of trouble. And there would also be um, a lot of mental, moral, and physical health benefits that kids would have from recreation, from the opportunity to run around in a park. Um, so we have some photos here on this screen and our next of uh, some early 20th century playgrounds in Chicago uh, with some very tall, scary looking jungle gyms and uh, some kids playing ball at uh, a park uh, near Polk and Halstead Streets. And then we have some other, other images of early playgrounds in the 20th century as well in Chicago uh, with a very scary looking seesaw and some cool looking slides too. So this is the sort of thing that kids had uh, in the early 20th century as far as playgrounds went. But if 
you have seen the movie The Music Man or are familiar with the premise of that musical, um, you are actually familiar as well with some aspects of the recreation movement, whether you realized it or not. Um, because the concerns and goals of the playground and recreation movement did make their way into pop culture through The Music Man in the 50s and 60s, uh, especially thanks to the song Trouble. Uh, you got Trouble in River City with a capital T and it rhymes with P and it stands for pool, it's our pool hall here in that top photo. Um, so the composer of the musical, Meredith Wilson, he based, he based the musical on his childhood in a small town in Iowa and he grew up during the progressive era. And so he set the musical in 1912 and the premise um, of the musical has the character, a con man, Harold Hill, kind of taking a a play out of the playbook of the recreation movements because he's coming into this town with the intent of getting these townspeople to buy into his con, form a municipal boys band to give the boys a good, safe place to spend some of their free time instead of the brand new pool hall that just opened in town and was really concerning the parents of the city. Um, that that pool hall would, according to Harold Hill, he played on these fears they had and points it out to the parents in the song, you got trouble in River City, that uh, the pool hall is a first step on a slippery slope to all kinds of vices, like drinking, gambling, smoking, neglecting your responsibilities around the house. So his response was form a boys band, give these kids a more virtuous leisure activity, just like the recreation movement suggests. And here in Des Plaines, um, we did have a prominent civic leader that was intrigued by the recreation and playground movements. Uh, that's Dr. Clarence Earle, who's on the left. Uh, he was a medical doctor in Des Plaines, and he believed so strongly in the benefits of play and recreation that he actually built a mini recreation area for his children uh, in the yard of his home, uh, which is here on the right. And the Earl House uh, was located at Minor Street and River Road, where the landmark condos are today. And the Earl children, they played on a small baseball diamond and a tennis court that Dr. Earl built for them in the backyard of the house. And since the house ran right up against the Des Plaines River, the river also provided the kids uh, with a recreation area as well in their backyard. They could swim and boat in the river in the summer. And during the winter, when the river froze, they could ice skate out there behind their house. So Dr. Earl, he had this private recreation area for his family's use behind his home, but he was also very interested in bringing uh, recreation to his fellow citizens here in Des Plaines. He believed everyone stood to benefit from these types of areas. Um, so he was very interested in the public, uh, or the uh, recreation and playground movements, and actually corresponded with one of the leaders of, uh, of those movements here in the Chicago area, Jane Adams. And we are not exactly sure what Dr. Earl uh, said to Jane Addams in a letter he sent in 1910. We do not have his letter to her, but we do have Jane Addams' response to <clears throat> Dr. Earl. Um, and in this letter, from what Jane Addams says, it seems that Dr. Earl had corresponded with her asking for her opinion on whether public funding for recreation facilities uh, was something she believed could be a potential possibility in the state of Illinois. And Dr. Earl, that is something he wanted to see happen, so he turned his interest in recreation into civic action, and in 1919, he became one of the founders of the Park District uh, in Des Plaines. And by that time, by 1919, uh, Des Plaines was no longer a small town, but it was a growing city. Um, it served as a service center providing goods and services to farmers uh, in the 19th century, but by 1919, by the 20th century, it had a growing population, and there were a number of people who actually lived and worked here in the city of Des Plaines itself, and so there was a need for an organized system of parks and public recreation for the benefit of city residents. So on February 17th, 1919, Des Plaines residents voted on whether uh, to provide public funding for recreation and form a park district here in the city. And they overwhelmingly voted yes to support a park district. Uh, there were 75 yes votes to only six no votes. Uh, and Dr. Earl, our old pal here, uh, he was the first treasurer of the Des Plaines Park District Board of Commissioners. So very involved from the beginning as well there. 
uh, the first 10 years of the park district in the 1920s uh, were really focused on creating parks and recreation space in the city. And there are a few different ways that the park district pursued this. Um, the first was through a partnership uh, with the city of Des Plaines. Some of the earliest parks were actually located on city land but were maintained by the Des Plaines Park District. And two of those early parks were Earl Field and a bandstand that stood downtown. And Earl Field is here on the far right of uh, this photograph here from the 19 teens. Um, it was located on the site of today's Central School and was a space where Des Plaines residents could have picnics, could play baseball games, football games as well. And then another one of the early parks uh, was a bandstand that was located on a triangular piece of land uh, at the intersection of Jefferson Street, Lee Street, and Park Place. Uh, concerts were held at the bandstand on summer Thursday nights for the public. Um, there are also speakers who would uh, use that bandstand for their programs as well, like in this bottom right-hand photograph. But throughout the 1920s, um, there were some other ways that the Park District created parks of their own. Um, and one way was through purchasing small pieces of land on corners throughout the city to create neighborhood parks throughout Des Plaines. And another way that the Park District uh, uh, created parks in the 20s was to ask residential developers when they were building a new subdivision to donate a lot in that subdivision to the Park District so that that would create a neighborhood park for these new residents in that subdivision. But the 1920s, uh, unfortunately, ended on a low note for the country when the stock market crashed in October 1929 and the Great Depression began. Um, at the Depression, it was a time of high unemployment and economic difficulty for many Americans and for many people here in Des Plaines as well. But in spite of these hard times, uh, the Des Plaines Park District actually undertook a very large construction project during the Depression, which resulted in Rand Park. And the park districts, uh, to build Rand Park, received federal aid from the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. Uh, the WPA was a New Deal program, and they provided jobs to unemployed Americans on uh, public works projects, like building roads, building bridges, and building recreational facilities like Rand Park here in Des Plaines. And on this project, uh, the WPA only hired Des Plaines Park District residents. Uh, which really raised the spirits of many Des Plaines families during a hard time of high unemployment. And at the time that construction began in 1936, uh, the Des Plaines Suburban Times reported that one of the features of the park is the increase in the morale of the men employed. They've been given something constructive to do, and all being <laughs> residents within the confines of the park district, they feel that they are accomplishing a work for themselves and their children. And the Park District, throughout construction of Rand Park, further supported the local economy um, by buying as many supplies as they could from Des Plaines businesses, uh, like Kinder Hardware, the Prairie Lee Paint Store, Sigwalt Lumber, CL Bishop Plumbing and Heating, just to name a few of those, of those businesses the Park District supported. But construction at Rand Park began in 1936 and was completed in 1940. And the new park featured a field house, a pool, tennis courts, softball fields, and baseball fields. And the baseball and softball fields could actually be used for night play, uh, thanks to light poles that the park district purchased from the 1933 Century of Progress World's Fair uh, in Chicago after the fair ended. And the field house, which we have two photos of right here, uh, was the first community center uh, that the Des Plaines Park District built. And so soon after construction finished, uh, Des Plaines residents began affectionately referring to the building as the White Elephants, given its large size, um, which you can see in the left-hand photo, and its white exterior, which you get a good view of here in this right-hand photo. But the Field House, when it opens uh, in February 1940, the very first event held there uh, was the Des Plaines Fire Department's annual dance. Uh, which you have a program for that dance here on the left-hand side. Uh, but the Field House at Rand Park, it provided space not just for park district programs, uh, but also uh, as a community center, it provided meeting spaces and program spaces for other displays, organizations, and community groups. 
Um, and so there were a lot of veterans groups like the American Legion, um, which you have a program of here that did hold some events at Rand Park over the years. Uh, there were a lot of other clubs and organizations, uh, businesses, churches, schools that all utilized Rand Park as an event space and as a meeting space uh, as well. Carnivals uh, could also stage their midway on the grounds in front of the field house. Uh, we have a shot of one of those carnivals in the 1940s here on the screen. Uh, and then the Displains uh, Theater Guild and the Displains Dance Club both also used uh, the Rand Park Field House for their performances and their classes um, as well. But the pool at Rand's Park uh, was something that uh, the Park District first discussed in 1929, building a community pool. And the Rand Park Pool, uh, when that opened on August 5th, 1940, that idea really became a reality. And the park districts uh, filled this pool with 538 gallons of water over the course of three days to avoid overwhelming the city's water system. And when the uh, pool opened on August 5th, 1940, it was not a very nice day. It was very rainy. The weather was not great. Uh, but nearly 100 people came out anyway to take a look at this new pool and take the first swim there. So, pretty successful day even, even though the weather was not that great. But in the 1930s, there is another uh, park district tradition, popular tradition that began at that time, outdoor ice skating rinks. And before the park district started creating outdoor ice rinks, um, Des Plaines residents, if they were brave enough and they wanted to ice skate, they could actually skate on the Des Plaines River itself when it froze. Um, so we do have a resident, James Radline, in this left-hand photo skating on the river in the 1930s. But by the end of the 30s, by 1939, the park district started making rinks um, by flooding parks and tennis courts during the winter once the weather, uh, what the weather became cold enough. And in 1939, those rinks were created through collaborative efforts. Uh, the park district provided the labor to make the ice rinks. The fire department supervised the flooding and the city provided the water at no charge. And the skaters themselves, Des Plaines residents, had a job as well to maintain these rinks. It was the responsibility of the ice skaters to keep the ice clear of snow. Uh, because when the snow covers the ice, that insulates the ice from the colder air temperatures, may cause that ice to melt. So it was up to the skaters to make sure that, I, that snow was cleared from the ice if they wanted these rinks to stick around through the winter. But the period following World War II was a period of change um, in Des Plaines and for the Des Plaines Park Districts. Um, just like other suburbs across America at the time, uh, Des Plaines experienced a post-World War II population boom. In 1940, the year before the United States entered World War II, uh, the population of Des Plaines was 9,518 people. And by 1960, uh, the population grew to 34,886 people and was still continuing to grow. So uh, this growing population uh, meant that the park district needed to expand their facilities and programming space um, in order to continue meeting the needs of the community. So in the 1950s, the park district, for the first time, transitioned from a part-time administrative staff to a full-time administrative staff. They also built new parks in the 1950s, like Cumberland Park, West Park, and South Park, which we know as Art Park today. In the 1960s, uh, they built two new pools at Iroquois and Chippewa Parks to join Rand Park as your pool options here in the park district. And in 1979, they renovated the old Maple School building and turned it into the Administrative and Leisure Center. And programming uh, in the three decades after World War II also expanded. It wasn't just the facilities. Um, in the late 1940s and 1950s, uh, the Youth Center provided Des Plaines teenagers a place to hang out with some of their friends on Friday and Saturday nights in the basement of the Rand Park Field House. And the teenage members of the Youth Center, they actually operated the Youth Center themselves. Uh, they made and enforced their own rules. They kept their own books. And each member was also expected to help cook, clean, and serve at the Youth Center a minimum of five nights every year. 
And they used an east side basement room at the Rand Park Field House. And the Displains Theater Guild performed just above them in the Field House. So sometimes these performances had a little extra sound effects from the Field House in the basement. Um, a Theater Guild 1958 newsletter records that after their most recent performance, uh, that during their performances, there were shouts of glee, banging of doors, slapping of ping pong paddles that could be heard during their play coming from the youth center in the basement. Um, so unfortunately for the Displains Theater Guild and their performances, it does sound like the youth center uh, was a hit with Displains teenagers and that they did have a lot of fun there. So good thing for them, but um, in the 50s, there were some other uh, youth programs that were founded as well. Uh, Little League Baseball and the Ponytail and Cup Softball Leagues. And Little League, they played their first season here in Des Plaines in 1953. Des co uh, the Des Plaines Park District was a co-sponsor. And during their opening season, the Little League teams played at Earl Field, uh, which was the site of baseball games dating back to the 1920s. And today, Central School occupies the site of Earl Fields, but Displains Youth Baseball, they still actually play uh, some of their games on the baseball diamonds that are just behind Central School. So still in that, still in that original space where we've been playing baseball in Displains for almost a century. But the girls also had their own ball league that was formed in the 50s, the Ponytail Softball League. Um, and that formed in 1957 after Central School student Eileen Kent suggested that the Park District offer a summer ball league for girls just like they did for the boys. And the Park District thought that was a great idea, so they approached Algonquin Junior High School English teacher Phyllis Johnson to organize and run this new girls softball league. And the girls, they had two practices a week. They played their games on Saturday nights under the lights at Rand Park. And in the 50s, uh, their, the end of their first season, uh, there was a Ponytail League All-Star game played against the South Park Little League All-Stars as a boys versus girls matchup. And that boys versus girls game um, began due to a feud uh, between Phyllis Johnson, the girls softball coach, and uh, South Park uh, Little League coach Jack Kunkel when the boys boasted uh, that they, they really thought they could beat a bunch of girls at a game of baseball. And they may have been a little bit too confident because unfortunately for the boys, the girls, uh, the girls won. Uh, won a rout, really. Um, they, beat, they beat the boys' all-star team in a 15-7 game in 1957. They played a rematch the following summer, 1958, and the boys won that game, 27-15. Um, and after the rematch game in 1958, the girls' coach, Phyllis Johnson, um, she joked with the Displays Journal, that's it's good psychology to let the boys win once in a while. <laughs> so... They did continue those boys versus girls games into the 1960s, the Little League teams and the Ponytail Softball League. Uh, but the 50s and 60s also saw the addition of one of the largest and most popular parks um, in the Displains Park District, Lake Park. And Lake Park actually has an interesting beginning. Uh, in 1957, the land at Tui and Howard Avenues uh, that became Lake Park, it was at that time being used as an excavation site related to the Northwest Tollway construction. And this site acted as a borrow pit um, for the toll road. So the land that was excavated or borrowed um, from this pit was then taken and used to form the uh, roadway base and the embankments for the toll road. And in 1959, the Park District purchased that construction site um, from the construction company for $1 and were uh, set to take possession of the land once the toll road construction finished. And Lake Park opened to the public in 1961, and it took about two years for that borrow pit, that excavated land, to actually fill with water and form Lake Opeka. And Lake Opeka was named for Frank Opeka, the park district attorney, uh, who died earlier in 1961. And after the park opened, uh, Lake Park provided a space for boating, fishing, ice skating, and uh, a home for the park district's summer day camps. Uh, the Lake Park Golf Course opened in 1963. 
And in 1975, the Lake Park Memorial Pavilion was built. Uh, and the pavilion acts as a living memorial uh, to displays residents that lost their lives in military conflicts from the Civil War to today. And it's a popular space um, for concerts, movies in the park, the annual Memorial Day ceremony, and is also the main stage for uh, the annual Fall Fest uh, as well. But fishing and boating are two popular activities on Lake Opeka during warmer months. Uh, today, the park district rents paddle boats, kayaks, and fishing boats for use on the lake. And the Des Plaines Yacht Club, they sail on the lake as well. And they've been sailing on Lake Opeka since 1962. And the Yacht Club, they host regattas, they teach sailing classes, and uh, they have an annual Sail a Sailboat Day every summer to introduce, uh, introduce the public to the sport of sailing. But Lake Opeka is a man-made lake. And as a result of that, it lacked uh, the rocky areas that fish usually use for habitats. Uh, so at the recommendation of the Illinois Department of Conservation in 1966, the Des Plaines Park District created a habitat for the fish in Lake Opeka. Uh, they took an old, worn-out jeep, they towed it to the center of the lake during the middle of winter when it was covered in ice, they removed the motor and the tires of the jeep, they replaced the windows with chicken wire, and in the spring, when the lake melted, the jeep sank to the bottom of the lake and created a habitat for fish. Um, and the intent was that this fish habitat, this jeep, might attract some of the lake's smaller fish. And as a result of that, the lake's larger fish might follow them there and create an angling spot for fishermen. And in the 60s, uh, fishermen at Lake Opeka, they're asked to keep their catches, submit a creel card to the park district, and at the end of the season, the Park District used these Creel cards uh, to award the Eric Stamborski Big Fish Award for the largest fish that was caught on Lake Opeka that year. In the 60s, Lake Opeka was also used um, for ice skating as well when the lake reached a depth, an ice depth of eight inches minimum. And it wasn't just open skates um, that occurred on Lake Opeka in the winter. Speed skating races were also held on the lake as well by the Des Plaines Speed Skating Club uh, beginning in the 1960s. And in the 60s and 70s, the park district sponsored um, an annual speed skating meet. And by 1975, they were in their 10th year, uh, which we have right up here. And there were several members of the Des Plaines Speed Skating Club um, that did uh, achieve quite a bit of success in the sports and uh, made it all the way to the North American Junior uh, Speed Skating Championships. In the 1970s, uh, the Park Districts began tailoring uh, their program offerings to the trends and interests of the day. So that's the programs that uh, were provided for residents were the kinds of things that they would find interesting and fun. Um, so in the 70s, that meant that activities like yoga, belly dancing, DIY activities were added to the Park Districts program offerings since those were very popular at the time. And in the 80s and the 90s, popular programs um, included dog obedience training, mixed couples bridge, uh, hip hop dance, and step aerobics. And the 80s and 90s also saw the park district beginning to offer local and affordable entertainment options for Des Plaines residents, so you didn't need to leave the city to have a good time. Um, so the park district, they started sponsoring events like golf tournaments at Lake Park, um, including the Chili Open golf tournaments. Uh, during which golfers will play a chilly and possibly snowy as well round of golf in the middle of winter and then warm up afterwards with a bowl of chili and some hot chocolate. And uh, in the 90s, uh, the Yagata Regatta cardboard boat race was held on Lake Opeka uh, where homemade boats were raced across the lake and the boat that finished first or did not sink, uh, whereas the only one that did not sink uh, would wind up winning that, winning that competition. But there are some other changes, some big changes that occurred in the 80s and 90s um, at the Park District as the Des Plaines Park District renovated existing facilities and also added some new facilities as well. Uh, the Rand Park Pool especially underwent a number of changes during that time. Uh, two 37-foot flume water slides were added to the pool in 1983. 
and the first person to take a ride down the brand new water slide uh, was Tommy Talazinski. Uh, he was a local hero. Earlier in 1983, uh, he saved the life of another boy, Robbie Lightfoot, when he fell into the lake at the Bay Colony condos. And Robbie was the second person ever to take a ride down the brand new water slide in 1983. But 1996 saw the Rand Park pool transforming into a water park uh, thanks to uh, extensive renovations and it opened uh, in 1996 as the Mystic Waters Family Aquatic Center. And this new water park included a zero depth pool, lap lanes, a lazy river, and a deep well pool underneath some slides. And the two 37 foot uh, water slides from 1983 they were still there and were incorporated into the brand new water park. But these renovations at Rand Park that occurred in the 80s and 90s um, led not only to the creation of this water park, but it also meant the end of the Rand Park Field House. Uh, because in the late 1980s, the park district determined that the repairs that were needed to bring the field house up to code uh, were too costly. So instead, they decided to build a new community center at Prairie Lakes Park, which opened in 1992. And the Prairie Lakes Community Center offers athletics, fitness, and programming space, as well as a 17,000 square foot theater facility. So just like the old Rand Park Field House, the Prairie Lakes Community Center was a space um, that was available for the entire community. Uh, clubs, organizations, schools, music groups, continue to use this as a meeting and event space, just as they had Rand Park Field House. And in the 1990s, there was actually a new staff member added to uh, the Park District, Craig the Border Collie. Uh, he joined the Park District in 1998 to control the geese population in the parks around the town. And these geese patrols, they'd occur three to six times daily, eight or nine months out of the year. And they would vary the number and uh, the timing of these daily patrols to keep the geese from catching on and sensing a pattern. But Craig, since he was a Border Collie, and that's a working dog breed, uh, Border Collies uh, have a natural instinct to herd animals. So they're very well suited to activities like herding geese out of a park and herding them into a lake or a pond instead. But Craig, unfortunately, he died in the line of duty in October 1998. He chased some geese out of Lake Park and across 2E Avenue, and on his way trying to cross the street back into the park, he was hit by a car. But Craig, in his short time with the Des Plaines Park District, he performed so well that the Park District brought in Jeff as his successor as a geese patrol dog. And by 2005, uh, the Park District's Geese Patrol expanded to include three dogs, Jeff, as well as Shadow and Riley. Uh, and staff members housed, handled, and trained these dogs uh, for the Park District. But the first 19 years of this century, the 21st century, um, have been an exciting time for the Des Plaines Park District. Um, programs to improve health and wellness have proved popular with adults uh, in this new century. So they inspired events like the 2008 exercise in the park at the Lake Park Memorial Pavilion. And there were also some new youth teams that formed um, in, in the 2000s as well, like the Des Plaines Duck Swim Team in 2002. Yeah, and in 2000, the Park District, they started this new century off with a brand new facility. Uh, they purchased the state-of-the-art Golf Center displays, and that debuted for the public in 2001 after some renovations. And in these first 20 years of this century, there were some uh, renovations uh, that occurred at some older existing facilities so they could be continue, uh, continue to be used and enjoyed by another generation. Um, and there were some existing facilities that expanded as well. Uh, so in 2005, the Mountain View Mine Mini Golf Course at Prairie Lakes Park was joined by a BMX and a skate park and batting cages as well to form the new Mountain View Adventure Center uh, at Prairie Lakes. But 2019, this is the centennial year of the Des Plaines Park District. And so as the Park District is entering its second century, um, they're continuing to grow and thrive and, and really respond to the changing needs and interests of Des Plaines residents. And just this year, um, 
a cricket oval opens at Prairie Lakes Park. Uh, the Park District also broke ground on a new indoor swimming pool at Prairie Lakes Community Center. And this summer, in July 2019, uh, the Park District will celebrate their centennial year with the addition of a brand new uh, Centennial Park at Center and Oakwood Streets. And the Park District is planning to bury a time capsule um, at Centennial Park to mark the occasion. And included in this time capsule uh, will be written memories of the Park District from Des Plaines residents, uh, past and present. So before you head out this afternoon after our, our coffee talk ends, um, take a minute, write down on our, one of our notepads your memories of the Park District if you'd like them to be included in that time capsule, and then rediscovered when the time capsule is opened uh, 50 years from now. All right, well thank you guys for coming out this afternoon.